Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, and welcome to our quarterly AFC Fund webinar. My name is Thomas Hugger, and I'm the CEO and founder of Asia Frontier Capital. With me today are Ruchir Desai in Hong Kong, who is managing with me the AFC Asia Frontier Fund together. Ahmed Tabak Charlie, the chief strategist of the AFC Iraq Fund, is today in London. Scott Osharoff, the CEO, uh, chief investment officer of the AFC Uzbekistan Fund, joins us from Tashkent in Uzbekistan. And Vicente Nguyen, the chief uh, investment officer of the AFC Vietnam Fund, is based in Ho Chi Minh City. This webinar will last about 45 minutes, and thereafter, you will have the opportunity to ask questions during our 15 minutes Q&A session after the presentations. You can submit your questions online through the Q&A icon at the bottom of this Zoom window on your laptop or PC. The performances of the global and emerging stock markets in the second quarter 2023 were generally positive, and the inflation and interest rates declined slightly. And as usual, Ruchi Desai will provide us now with an econ economic update and investment outlook for the Asian Frontier Markets and also for the AFC Asia Frontier Fund. Ruchi, over to you. Uh, thank you, Thomas, and welcome everyone to our usual quarterly webinar. So what I'll probably do is just spend a few, few minutes on uh, performance of our fund and also the Asian Frontier Markets so far this year, probably in the first seven months of 2023. So as this chart shows you, actually Asian frontier markets have had a pretty solid start and have done very well so far this year uh, to the surprise of many. But I'm not so, so surprised given the fact that valuations are so cheap, interest rates had peaked out, inflation had peaked out. So very strong start for Asian frontier markets to the year, or at least for the first half of this year. Uh, and not just strong start, they've outperformed pretty much all the regional markets like Philippines, Thailand, China. Uh, Malaysia, etc. So pretty strong performance across the board for many of our markets. And as you can see, as the chart shows, Sri Lanka is, is actually one of the top performing markets globally this year. It's, it's number three after Argentina and Greece in terms of dollar term performance up almost 46%. And of course, Iraq also has done well, but even Vietnam has come back pretty strongly. So has Kazakhstan. And this has led to pretty strong performance for the fund as well. The fund is up about 11% so far this year uh, as of yesterday. Uh, in yeah, that's the estimated performance for this month as well. Uh, so up about 11% for the year. Again, pretty strong performance. Uh, and like I said, I'm not so surprised given the strong bounce back for Asian frontier markets because valuations were very attractive going into 2022. And as, as I said, interest rates had peaked out, inflation had peaked out. Uh, and I'll come to about I'll come come to inflation interest rates in the later slides. But basically this year the performance so far has been driven uh, as the bullet point, uh, the last bullet point on the slide shows is driven in that order by Iraq, Kazakhstan, Sri Lanka, Vietnam, Cambodia, and Georgia. So pretty much across the board, strong performance has not just come from one country or a few stocks, it's pretty much uh, broad-based strong performance across our markets, which has helped fund performance. And as the next slide shows you, as I was discussing, uh, lower inflation is really helping our markets. So as this chart shows you, inflation is coming off pretty strong in many of our markets. For example, in Georgia, inflation is down to just below 1% from in more than 10% at the same time last year. While in Kazakhstan, it's been coming off also in the last couple of months to about 14.6%. And in Vietnam, anyway, inflation was not really an issue, but it's it's still come off from you know 3 or 4% to about 2% in June. So uh, pretty good indicators or in general, pretty pretty good for our macros and in general for investors, investor sentiment as well. And more importantly, for central banks in terms of managing monetary policy. So as the next chart shows you... Uh, you know, given that inflation is coming off and more importantly, the U.S. Fed is kind of done with the interest rate hikes. I guess they'll do one more hike of 25 basis points tomorrow, but pretty much in my view, they're done. And uh, that's been the key uh, highlight for this year. I would say in general for emerging and frontier markets that the U.S. Fed is done with the aggressive interest rate hike cycle last year. Of course, there is this year as well, but not as aggressive, aggressive as last year. And that obviously has given confidence to central banks now universe to manage their monetary policies uh, because of this. And also, in, in addition to this, inflation has been coming off uh, across the markets because of the base effect from last year, plus lower food costs, uh, lower supply chain costs as well. And as you can see, as this chart shows you, you know, in, 
Sri Lanka, the Central Bank in Sri Lanka has cut interest rates by 450 basis points basically in the last two months. Vietnam has cut by 150 basis points in April and Georgia 50 basis points uh, also a couple of months ago. And actually, this is just the start, I would say, of the interest rate cutting cycle because in Asian frontier central banks actually raised interest rates very aggressively, especially in 2022. Sri Lanka raised by about almost 900 basis, 900 basis points last year. Uh, Pakistan has been raising aggress aggressively as well. So has been Kazakhstan in the first half of last year also. So I think as inflation starts coming off, especially from the fourth quarter of this year and also going into 2024, I won't be surprised to see further interest rate cuts uh, in many of our markets going forward, which will be very positive for investor sentiment. Uh, and just moving on to the next slide. Uh, uh, just a word on Sri Lanka. So I was in Sri Lanka last month. Uh, actually, the second time I've been in the last probably six or seven months. I was in November 2022. Uh, when I was there last year, end of last year, and the feeling I got was that things had bottomed out in terms of inflation, interest rates. The IMF deal was all, almost on the card. So basically, we were at the bottom of the cycle in Sri Lanka. Uh, the whole market was trading at about four and a half times P ratio. And when I went back uh, last month, the IMF deal was in place. Uh, the domestic restructuring just got announced a couple of weeks ago. Uh, inflation's come off significantly at about 12%, which I'll talk about later as well. And interest rates have been, you know, starting to get cut. So that's really driven strong performance and also the rupees appreciated. So driven strong performance for the Sri Lankan stock market. So in dollar terms, it's, it's pretty much outperformed all the emerging and frontier markets in the region also in general, all the major indices, indexes as this chart shows you. Uh, and as the next slide shows you, as I was discussing, uh, interest rates and inflation are coming off significantly in Sri Lanka. Uh, inter inflation is at about 12% in June. It was about at 70% in last September. In my view, because of the base effect and in general, uh, lower food, fuel and uh, supply chain costs, and also because the rupee appreciating, you will see inflation going into single digits by end of this month. And that's going to give the central bank room to even cut interest rates for the benchmark interest rates at about 12%. If inflation is at will be about 7 8% by end of this month and also going into the fourth quarter of this year, I think there's clearly more room for the central bank to cut interest rates, if not by 400 basis points, at least by 300 basis points by end of this year, because you don't need such high real interest rates, uh, given where inflation is at this point in time, or will be in a couple of months. And that's basically driving a lot of the domestic, domestic investors into the stock market. That's one key reason why the stock market has done well in Sri Lanka. It's not because of foreign investors, mainly because of domestic investors. As returns on fixed income and bank deposits come down, uh, you're going to see the shift into the equity market. And actually, we've seen that not only in Sri Lanka, we've seen that, in, for example, in, in Vietnam as well. And that's why Vietnam also, the market has rallied in the last couple of months because of the interest rate cut. And as the next slide shows you, uh, you know, one of the key factors besides, you know, the IMF deal and lower interest rates and inflation, I think more importantly, just from a macro, step, macro point of view, uh, tourism and remittances, which are key foreign exchange owners for Sri Lanka, seeing a very strong rebound. So as I mentioned, I was there last month, my hotel was full. Uh, I mean, I had full occupancy for that week, despite it being low season. Uh, so they've done pretty well. Tourism is seeing a pretty strong rebound this year. In fact, in the first uh, six months of this year, as the chart on the left shows you, they've seen a pretty strong monthly rebound in tourist uh, revenues. And in the first six, six months of this year, they've done about a billion dollars in revenues. So they'll do about $2 billion this year, which is still... Uh, you know, about less than 50% of pre-pandemic levels of about four and a half billion dollars. But given the trend and given the stability, they can easily go back to pre-pandemic numbers, I would say in the next, if not the next 12 months, at least the next 18 to 24 months, which is going to be very, very positive for the macro. And even remittances, in fact, remittances have come back much more strongly. They, they'll do about, they run about two and a half billion dollars in the first half of this year. They'll do about five and a half, six billion dollars for the whole of, for the rest of the year. I mean, for the whole year of 2023. And so it can easily get back to, you know, as the chart on the top right shows, you can easily get back to $7 billion, which was a pre-pandemic, pre-Easter Sunday attack number in 2018. And this will really drive the macro and really help build up foreign exchange reserves and really help them manage the current account. Because if you look at the estimates for the current account, deficit is about 1.5% of GDP from this year onwards over the next couple of years, which is completely manageable for any developing country, which is a net food and fuel importer. So I don't see a concern over there. 
Uh, so in general, you know, Sri Lanka, the sentiment is turning much more positive. The corporates and companies were, you know, were very optimistic, much more confident than especially compared to the last three or four years. Uh, so Sri Lanka basically hasn't got a chance to recover from the setbacks it faced in the last three or four years. 2019, you had the Easter Sunday attacks. Since 2020, you had the pandemic. And last year, you had the economic crisis. So I think now with some stability returning and valuations being so cheap and macro improving, there's a strong room for radiating because earnings also will recover going into next year. So I think the rally in Sri Lanka, I think will continue. And as the next slide shows you, we are invested in Sri Lanka, about 5% of our, of our fund is in, in Sri Lanka. We increased our weight a bit end of last year, beginning of this year. Uh, when I got back from Sri Lanka as well, we added a bit, uh, but the market has run up. So we, we will add if the market corrects a bit, but we will look to add to Sri Lanka because I think I'm more positive, not just for the next six months, but I would say, you know, I would say next 12 to 18 months as well. And these, these, as these, uh, as the chart shows you, uh, these are some of the holdings we have in Sri Lanka. They've done pretty well. In fact, done very well in local currency terms, they outperformed the index, uh, some of the banks, some of the consumer names you want. So pretty strong performance. In fact, Sri Lanka, as I mentioned, the initial part of my presentation has been one of the key drivers of performance for the fund so far this year. So that's a bit about Sri Lanka. And just in the next couple of slides, I'll talk about valuations. Uh, and you know, one might argue that the markets have run very well. Sri Lanka is up 45%. Vietnam is up 18%. Uh, the fund is up about 11% for the year. So how much more upside is there? I think there's still a lot more. I would say still there's pretty good upside even from here because valuations, even despite the rally, are still pretty, pretty in fact, very attractive. Uh, our fund trades at a P of 6.6, .6, which is the lowest ever P ratio ever. And in fact, the re-rating has already begun. So, you know, so I've been discussing this in the last few webinars since the beginning of the year that we are at the bottom of the cycle. And I won't be surprised to see, see a re-rating because inflation interest rates have peaked out and there's only room for the central banks to start cutting interest rates as inflation will come off because of the base effect and in general, lower commodity prices. So I think there's still a lot of room because I think the key driver for re-rating will not only be lower interest rates, which will drive re-rating in multiples, but also uh, the earnings recovery. I think the earnings will bottom out in pretty much all our markets, if not this quarter, at least by the third quarter of uh, 2023. So especially markets like Sri Lanka and Vietnam and Pakistan, I see earnings bottom bottoming out uh, by the end of this year and recovering next year. Uh, uh, so just, uh, so I would say shorter term, next six to nine months, Sri Lanka can still, Sri Lanka can do pretty well. And just a word on Pakistan, uh, uh, I think they, they could re see a rebound over there going forward as well, similar to what Sri Lanka has seen. There's a, there are possibilities. Uh, since the IMF deal was announced, a couple of, just, I think, 10 days ago, the markets rebound pretty strongly in local currency and also dollar terms. Uh, so as the elections are through by the end of the year, uh, I think uh, as inflation is coming off over there also or speaking out, I think Central Bank in Pakistan will also have room to cut interest rates from next year, uh, given that they're very high. So once that happens, you'll see a lot of domestic liquidity, which is waiting on the sidelines to move into the market. So I wouldn't be surprised to see Pakistan have a pretty good jump uh, in the next couple of months as well. And as, as these valuation shows you, despite what's going on with strong rally, all our pretty much all our markets traded less than 10 times. You know, Kazakhstan's less, about five, less than five times. Pakistan's about four and a half. Uh, Sri Lanka, the number sounds a bit high, but I think that's because the earnings are still pretty weak. So... If you look at the forward multiple, it's still about six, six and a half times. So still very attractive. Uh, so I would say still a lot of room for these markets to run and also for the performance to run going forward as well. Uh, and just sticking on to valuations, the next slide, as I was mentioning, uh, if you can move to the next slide, Peter, please. Yeah, and so as, as I was mentioning, uh, despite the rally, I think valuation is still very attractive. Uh, if you look at the current P ratios of our markets, still at a pretty big discount to their five-year historical averages. So uh, then from, th from that angle, I was still room to run despite the strong re-rating in many of our markets. And in general, I would say domestic sentiment has improved significantly pretty much across the board, especially in places like Sri Lanka, Pakistan, and Vietnam. Uh, Bangladesh is slowly but surely improving. So I think, uh, again, I would reiterate, reiterate that there's a lot of room for our markets to do well in the next couple of, I would say, next 12 to 18 months. Uh, and just on the next few slides, I'll just talk a bit about the trends, a uh, few minutes on that. I think I've already spoken about on all on these trends on in, in our previous webinars as well, but just, you know, just to refresh everyone's memory, uh, I think from a supply chain diversification perspective, Vietnam is by far 
the prime beneficiary in Asia, uh, you know, from a manufacturing export perspective. So, for example, if you look at the chart on the top left, uh, FDI has been very consistent despite the pandemic, despite slow global economic growth, and despite you know whatever else is happening globally. Uh, even this year, they are they estimated to do about twenty billion dollars in FDI. Uh, in 2023, there are, they've done about $10 billion in the first half of this year. So I think they can easily do $20 billion this year as well. And that's pretty much, uh, as the chart on the top right shows you, that's, that's going to be pretty uh, positive for export growth. Yes, exports will be weak this year because of the slowdown in Europe and the US, which are the key export markets. So exports are down about 10% for the year. But I'm not so concerned about that because the FDI numbers are so strong and most of this FDI goes into man the manufacturing sector, which is meant for the exports. So it's very positive for long-term export growth. And as, as coming back to the chart on the top right, I mean, um, the last 10-year uh, growth rate for Vietnam's exports have been have been fantastic. I don't think any other country in Asia or Asian export has shown these kind of growths, growth rates in the last decade, basically. Uh, in fact, you, Vietnam has become a very strong trade partner for the U.S. in the last, especially since 2017 when the trade war and tensions between U.S. and China began. In fact, uh, Vietnam's exports to the U.S. have gone from about $42 billion in 2017 to about $110 billion in 2022, so almost an increase of three times because of the manufacturing supply chain shift happening from mainland China into Vietnam. So it's really helping Vietnam a lot uh, or helping them significantly. And I don't see that trend stopping anytime soon. Uh, so I just move on to the next slide. It's not just about Vietnam. I think even Bangladesh is benefiting a lot as the, char as the chart on the top left shows you. Uh, they're the biggest... Uh, they're the second biggest garment exporter globally now after China. Uh, and despite what has happened, globe, uh, they do about $50 billion of garment exports a year now, which is, is pretty good achievement. Pakistan does $15 billion, So they've overtaken many of the peers or competitors. Uh, but this, uh, you know, despite the global economic slowdown of the last couple of quarters, I think, uh, well, actually, Bangladesh's garment exports have grown by about 10% in the last 12 months. Uh, despite what's going on globally, and that's an outperformance against the other government exporting nations like Vietnam, Indonesia, and Pakistan, I think, which have all shown negative growth. So, again, benefiting from these supply chain trends or supply chain relocation trends uh, as well. And as the chart on the top right shows you, yes, from a government export sector perspective, specifically, I think Asian frontier markets have benefited a lot in terms of market share gains, especially to the U.S. post the uh, trade tensions or trade war between China and the U.S. Uh, so, in fact, in the last five years, uh, Vietnam, Bang Bangladesh, and Cambodia have actually gained market share uh, at the expense of China in terms of garment exports to the U.S. So, again, a pretty strong trend for many of our markets and benefiting from these trade tensions and supply chain relocations. And as the next slide shows you, it's not just about Bangladesh or Vietnam. I think even Central Asia is a region to watch, which I've been mentioning in the last few webinars. This, is, this region is benefiting quite a bit from the conflict in Ukraine and all the tensions between the Western and Russia, basically. And one country which really stands out is Georgia. As the chart on the top left shows you, they've seen a significant increase in their exports. Yes, yeah, some of these exports are re-exports to Russia. I don't have an exact number, but yeah, some of it is to Russia. But, but besides that, I think they're also benefiting from the supply chain relocation. Many, many of the supply chains that move from east to west and west to east are now moving via Georgia because they've got access to the Black Sea as well. In fact, their, their port, which is porty on the Black Sea coast, is operating at full capacity now. Uh, so benefiting from rising exports, rising remittances, rising tourism revenues. So Georgia has done about 7.5% GDP growth uh, this year, following on from 10% last year. So pretty strong performance because of these positive trends and in general as the you know chart on the top or, or image on the top right of the chart of the page shows you in general central asia is benefiting from these supply chain relocations or human resource relocations and i think georgia kazakhstan uzbekistan all benefiting so central asia which is a region to watch strong macro you know stable macro uh pretty stable gdp growth so that's something to watch uh, and i will just wrap up with my key message from from the presentation or from my from my presentation on the next slide uh on the key message is basically i think since the last three or four webinars especially at the beginning of the year and the key message has been that the key headwinds last year in 2022 were the high interest rates and high inflation and those we have behind those and uh 
and there was a strong chance for re-rating because of these headwinds being behind us. And now we've seen those headwinds kind of, especially in our markets, become sort of tailwinds because you've seen inflation come off, interest rates start coming down. And that's really led to a lot of domestic liquidity into our stock markets. And that's really helped performance as well. So I think this trend will continue going forward as well. Yeah, I think, you're, like I said, I think interest rates have all room to come down in many of our markets because they've, they were raised so aggressively. And also with the US Fed being done, I think in general, sentiment towards frontier and emerging markets will improve. So I see the momentum continuing going into not just 23, but also into 24, because earnings also see a strong recovery next year. Plus valuations are very attractive. So what I would end with saying is that valuations are tra- valuations as the table on the top of the chart shows are attractive. We have strong fundamentals in the portfolio. Uh, the re-rating has been strong this year. I think it will continue. So if uh, one is looking at a you know 12 to 18 month view, I think Asian frontier markets is the place to be because they will still perform pretty strongly going forward as well. Uh, so with that, I would hand over to Amit Tabakchali, who is the chief strategist of our AFC Iraq Fund. Over to you, Amit. Thank you. Thank you, Rusia, and uh, thank you everyone for attending and taking part. Uh, can we have the next slide, please? Okay, um, what I'm showing you here is not so much uh, beautiful pictures of Baghdad, but what I want to do is actually go over what this means, what is behind these pictures, and why am I highlighting them right now? Uh, he, uh, a key part of the investment thesis of the Iraq Fund, uh, the, the idea that we thought of um, seven years ago when the fund was launched, was basically that the country, as it shifts away from conflict, it will shift towards um, uh, productive investments and so forth. And what well, the missing element in that story and the one part that is just about to happen right now is stability. Um, Iraq, for the first time in the last, uh, since the 1980s, um, have seen the last five years a relative stability. Now, I know many will say, well, COVID and so forth, but yes, COVID and all of these things are uh, uh, given the fact that what, what Iraq has been to since 1980, they, they sound like you know almost non event so to speak. But basically, the, the basic idea I'm trying to highlight here and trying to show you in these pictures and the thesis that I have right now is that basically the uh, stability, the relative stability has provided a degree of predictability that allowed the private sector to begin to invest. Um, I personally have um, moved back almost full time uh, to Iraq in 19, seven, uh, 2017. Uh, from a you know before that I was going back and forth, but moved in uh, uh, full time, and um, the, the transformation is amazing. I mean I could see it, but and it was taking place, but it wasn't sort of so obvious to most people in a way. And we tried to highlight that over a number of uh, market newsletters. One was a few months ago when we discussed supermarkets. And granted, supermarkets are nothing um, exciting, so to speak, of unless you're a supermarket owner. Um, but the, the fact I was trying to make out uh, uh, and, and explain at the time, uh, the trend going on is that, yes, Iraq has had supermarkets since the 80s or even before then. Uh, but the, 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 the investment mindset has changed significantly. In the last few years, they've, they, they've changed from a, a, a store that sort of like, you know, converted building that had everything. By the way, what is available in stores has not changed, but what has changed is the way it was presented. So the mindset has changed from basically selling your equipment in an environment whereby you have risk into place whereby you think of reward. And that's what you'll see in, in the thing. So the picture on the left-hand corner, the most left-hand corner, shows a one of the malls that was built two years ago. And they, and, you know, again, uh, these things are nothing new for anyone who's um, uh, 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 who is in a relatively modern city. But in the sense of all the kind of news that I think any of you hear about Iraq, or whenever you read something about Iraq, you don't see private sector um, invest in buildings or or facades full of glass because, given the fact of conflict, they will not you know they will not be there. I saw that by the way. In 2017, at night, you drive by shops, they're all shuttered, they're all metal and so forth shuttered. Now it's actually very different. You see glass buildings, glass stores and so forth, just like anywhere else. And that is really the main thesis that we were um, uh, building on. And that's really what explains uh, the performances here. And again, I'll show you pictures, the other ones you see here on uh, residential complexes uh, being built or offices being built. Uh, if you see all of these buildings, there's nothing different than any other place that you might see worldwide. For Iraq, it's a huge, what it actually means, okay, construction by itself is not the big news, 
but the big basically is is that it like mean that there is a degree of uh, predictability as degree uh, uh, built investments and as such these investment will lead into consumer spending which ultimately will uh, uh, will lead into corporate profits and I by the way um, hope and expect that coverage of Iraq uh, will change. Um, however, just just to mention something as well on that, you all might or might not remember uh, there were talks a few years ago. You know, because every time you hear of Iraq, you only hear disaster news and so forth, which which almost puts people away. But uh, one of the news that was showing in all the time in the last few years, and it shows a degree of um, arbitrage that we see in in Iraq, and that basically on the uh, Mosul Dam. It was a few years ago that the Mosul Dam would be erupted and will flood the country, and it was worse than all things. Two days ago, I read a report, I can't remember if it was from the European Union or from the UN, that basically was saying that the actually dam is in good shape, all the repair work has done on it, and in fact, they were encouraging the government to fill it up with water. So it just shows you the shift of mentality uh, on the country, but also with that shift, you might see real interest uh, in the country. Can I have the next slide, please? Now, all of that explains to you, and you can see on the right-hand corner, a market that is actually just emerging from a brutal bear market. Yes, we've had a tremendous performance this year. Yes, the market looks very good this year, same as the fund. But you've got to keep it in mind that that is a performance out of a multi-year bear market. Uh, it's just emerging from a very, very low base. So the performance is compared to a low base. And it, I think in my mind, tells me how far uh, uh, we can go. Um, and, and in a sense, the trigger for the next market move or the thing which will accelerate the move and, and, and make it happen is basically the uh, budget. The budget has, um, which you might have seen discussed in the last um, few uh, newsletters, the budget has been passed at the end of the month and it's a super expansionary budget which actually will speed up the developments that I've explained earlier and should feed into corporate profits. And you can see into the uh, quarterly non-oil GDP, which is showing a pickup uh, in the first quarter. Yes, that's before the passage of the budget. And yes, the budget effect will happen in the second half of the year, but they'll happen um, with momentum behind them. And with those figures, I don't have a uh, place to put all kinds of different charts, but also you can see there is growth in the money supply, there is growth in uh, consumer lending, there's growth in activities. All of these things pretty much tell you that what we've seen is, is um, pretty much a realization of the investment pieces that we had in Iraq. It took longer um, than hoped for, but it played out almost according uh, uh, to expectations. Difference was in timing. Um, and again, uh, the performance has been very solid, um, and I expect more of that following there. And again, I'm not because we've had a wonderful performance, and therefore I'm extrapolating, uh, as, as most people do from a, a straight line, but basically basing it on fundamentals and basing it on um, the fact that the market is emerging from a multi-year bear market. I'll end it with the observation that uh, Rusher ended with, which is basically the peak in, in interest rate cycles. I think with it, you've all seen expectations on the uh, world growth have changed from uh, pretty much sort of like super negative ones into expectation that we might have to have some form of uh, soft landing or at least peak interest rates uh, uh, have happened and therefore interest rate rise will happen. But whereas before the expectations were only based on China, uh, uh, recovering now, the, the world could begin to recover in, in 24 and beyond. And that's positive for uh, oil prices or oil demand, which basically gives you the backdrop that Iraq is, the macro backdrop of Iraq is fairly positive. And I think with that, I thank you all for listening. And I passed on to my colleague, Scott, who looks after uh, our Uzbekistan fund. Thank you, Ahmed. Uh, good day, everyone. So Uzbekistan is certainly in a secular uh, bull market. The problem with secular bull markets is that they're long, multi-year, and you tend to have periods where not a lot happens. You have consolidations and there might not be a lot of news, things can be boring, but that doesn't mean that under the cover things are not happening. As I've mentioned time and again, both on these uh, quarterly updates and in our monthly commentary, Uzbekistan is more or less firing on all cylinders. Um, the country's doing very well. And it really hasn't been impacted by um, the global inflation that you've seen in the past sort of year and a half, even though you know, inflation's come down. Inflation has remained relatively steady in the country at about 12%. Um, and the economy continues to boom. And part of that is because it's not very well integrated with the global economy. Certainly it's increasingly so, but um, uh, coming from a very low base. 
So on the news front, there hasn't been a lot to talk about. Um, but again, you know, things are happening. And I'll, I'll talk about some of the, the companies in our portfolio in a moment. But probably the biggest news over the past few months is uh, amendments to the Constitution. So there have been discussions that the Constitution was going to be updated uh, more or less over the past year. They've been working on it. And earlier this year, I believe it was in March, uh, there was a referendum which led to um, changing roughly two thirds of the Constitution. And now the Constitution has been dubbed the social Constitution. Uh, and there, there were a lot of really interesting things which uh, were approved in it, or I guess amended, and that includes you know, increasing property rights. So for example, in March of 2020, there was legislation passed allowing for the privatization of land, but in the constitution, it was still illegal. Uh, now you have the ability to privatize non-agricultural land. Uh, if you're Uzbek or not Uzbek, which is huge, because if you look at any country more or less that has a large, robust middle class, usually uh, you have good property rights because the majority of one's wealth typically is uh, held in real estate, namely you know, their primary domicile. So that was really exciting. Um, further, you had a handful of uh, term limits introduced for the Speaker of Parliament, Supreme Court justices, general prosecutor, et cetera. You had a big push on uh, reforming education, which I've talked about time and again, that Uzbekistan has a severe capacity issue. And reforming education, unfortunately, will take a generation because you need to reform the education system and then have a generation of pupils go through the system. But nonetheless, the government knows that these are issues. And then probably the thing that got the most media attention, both domestically and internationally, but as we mentioned last month, was really a quote unquote nothing burger. Um, it was more formality, was that the Constitution saw the extension of the presidential term limit from five to seven years. And as a result of this, since President Mirziyoyev was serving his second five-year term, but under the new Constitution, he is not operating under the seven-year time frame. He called snap elections. So on the 9th of July, uh, there was an election and he won 87% of the votes. Not a surprise. Um, there was no interruption in the business environment and it you know, went smoothly as expected as we talked about this past month. Next slide, please. So while there's not a whole lot happening news-wise, again, the economy is doing well. Uh, you know, the cost of capital remains high. And as we've said, as it comes down, we expect a, you know, a big step change across the economy. But even with the high cost of capital right now in the 20 to 25% range, the economy is doing very well. Um, and you know, the companies that we have in our portfolio are continuing to grow very well. Some of them are seeing price appreciation. Others are seeing stability, which is leading to multiple compression as earnings remain very robust. Um, you know, as we've discussed before, um, is the capital markets legislation in due course is passed in parliament. Right now, my understanding is that it's being translated and then it's going to be sent out for public comment. So in due course, once, that, once that's passed and the market is connected to Euroclear and Clearstream, uh, you're going to potentially have that next phase of the, the revaluation in the capital markets. Uh, in the meantime, you know, you're seeing choppiness sort of from the lower left to the upper right nonetheless. And again, you're seeing a, a variety of multiple compression across some of our names, which is perfectly fine because they become increasingly attractive for us to buy. Uh, and there aren't that many countries in the world where you have you know, a, a broad capital markets where it's exceptionally cheap, but also growing very fast. So uh, these are three companies which recently have reported earnings. The first is a industrial spirits producer. They produce white spirits for the vodka and uh, the healthcare industry. Uh, their earnings grew 97%. Book value uh, grew 25%. Uh, the, and they're just outside of Tashkent. Then the other two cement producers, these are two companies that we also hold. Um, the first one brought on a new production line last year. So their earnings were up 170%. And the second one, grew earnings 138% and about a month, month and a half ago announced that they're building a second production line. So we're seeing multiple, or we're seeing earnings growth continue to be very robust. We're seeing multiples that are exceptionally attractive. And as we've mentioned before, 
over the past, say, three years, you've had a handful of companies which have initiated CapEx programs, and therefore a lot of them cut dividends, um, either entirely or they trim them. And over the next year, two or three, as a lot of these companies come out of their CapEx cycles, uh, we expect dividends to ramp up, which, again, will make these companies yet more attractive. So we remain exceptionally bullish on the market and the economy. And um, yeah, it's it's very well insulated from the global growth slowdown that you're seeing around the world. Um, and we expect it to continue to perform. So with that, I'll pass it on to uh, Vicente Nguyen, CIO of our Vietnam Fund. Thank you very much, Scott. So Peter, please. <clears throat> So if you look at this chart, you can easily that, see that the GDP growth of Vietnam already improved a little bit from 3.3% to 4.1% in the second quarter. And most of the number already improved, even though the improvement is not really big, but it's slightly recovered from the very low base of the GDP and the whole economy. The IAP and the FDI also improved a little bit in the second quarter. Uh, on third, exports still tumper around 12% compared to last year, but because last year we have very high base in terms of export. The most important thing of the second quarter GDP, uh, uh, the economic number in the second quarter is the public investment. So if you look at public investment, this is all I already mentioned in many, many terms and the last two web webinar that the country already put a lot of effort and investment into the public sector because this is the only way to provide a huge power for the whole economy to move under the, <clears throat> uh, the low consumption, the low demand of the whole world economy. And especially there, um, uh, to overcome the real estate crisis in Vietnam. So it reason why um, the country already pumped a lot of money into the public uh, sector to, to support the economy. So please go to the next, Peter. So if you look at these charts, you can see that Vietnam plan to deploy around 28 billion US dollar in this year. This mean around 6.5 to 7% of the whole GDP. So with this number, the country will, um, it will be supported strongly by the investment, the public investment. By this way, the government can create a lot of jobs, can make the economy circle again, can, <clears throat> can create the, the money supply for the whole economy right now. Uh, even though the liquidity of the banking sector is um, losing already a little bit, but it's still not very, very comfortable compared to before COVID-19. So <clears throat> we think that with the public investment, the government will be successful to, to support the economy and make it move again to, to get back the crow momentum again of the, of the country. Please go to the next. So what, what, what did they focus on public investment? One of the, the sector they really do very impressively is the highway network. So in, in this year, there will be 1,150 kilometers uh, of highway in Vietnam is much more 10 times than in 2010. So the country already did a lot of effort and they, they tried to, to complete much more highway as much as possible. And they also give out a very ambitious plan uh, by to reach 3,000 kilometer of highway by 2025, 5,000 kilometer by um, 2030, and 9,000 kilometers of 2050. So as you know, this, this story maybe a little bit look like a China story uh, 20 years ago. They also put a lot of money into the infrastructure to build a highway, to build electricity, to build an airport, everything. And consequently, those kind of projects really help the economy to improve the productivity of the economy. I can give you an, an example about this thing. Please go to the next. So this is one of uh, the highway I just experienced myself this year. 
So the highway just completed in, uh, in April this year. So last year, we made a company tour to visit a company in Fuyen, a, a coastal uh, province in the center of Vietnam is around 600 kilometers from uh, Ho Chi Minh City. So last year, we, it took us nearly 12 hours to move by car from Ho Chi Minh City to, to, to Fuyen. But this year, I did it again. Um, we also visited company over there, and it just took us roughly 7.5 hours. So it means we already saved 4.5 hours. So it's, this is so how the economy grow, will grow and how it's improved the product, productivity of the, the whole economy. So I strongly believe that after the government put a lot of money into the public sector to make highway, to connect the north and the south, to make the route very, very smooth and very, very fast, it will make the economy jump, absolutely. Please go to the next. So after all, I already mentioned many, many times in the last three, four, a uh, webinar of AFC. So actually, the the twelve month for our PE of Vietnam in gas is right now is around ten years low. If you come back to two thousand twelve and two thousand thirteen, when the the previous real estate crisis happened, is also that low. And as you remember, I already mentioned, okay, in the, in the last two webinars, if you invest at this time, you will, you will enjoy the, how to say, the, the performance in the next five years because the economy will grow very solid, uh, very firm in the next five years after the government put a lot of effort and investment in, into the public sector. Otherwise, they also cut rates, they also reduce the tax, they also cut tax, they also delay the tax, everything they do and to support the manufacturing company and, and export company. So after three, two quarter, actually the index recover and right now is the PE uh, for uh, 12 month forward PE of Vietnam index around 12 time. Uh, it's much higher than yeah, six months ago, but but if you look, if you compare the PE of the index in 2018, it's still far away. So it can easily uh, another 50% in the next five years. So I strongly believe that the index, the stock market of Vietnam will improve in the next five years strongly. This is what I strongly believe. So we should invest right now. Yep. So we'll go to the next. And I already mentioned in the, the, um, the previous uh, two webinar what we already plan to do. And until now, I will just want to keep you updated what we, we already done. So we, in the short term, we, we keep uh, uh, um, investing in insurance sector because, um, because insurance sector benefit a lot in this year due to the high interest rate environment. The reason why the first in the first quarter, the insurance sector increased 9% net profit uh, compared to minus 3% of the index. And according to the latest number uh, this quarter, uh, three insurance in our portfolio already reported the net profit increased 59%, 95%, and 220% year on year. So this is so how the, the earning growth of the insurance sector. For the mid and long term, we will switch from high dividend stock to the crow stock to capture the five years crow, the five year crow, as um, I mentioned that um, manufacturing company and construction company in public sector will, will benefit this crow. So we already did it. And right now we're almost done with this switching. And we also focus on more in manufacturing stock and public investment beneficiary, and we're almost done. So actually, in our portfolio, there's a, an example. We, we have a company um, doing business in a building fridge. So they're providing sima, uh, no, beton for the concrete, for, for, the, for the fridge builder. And the net profit of this company in the first quarter increased more than 150%. And 
as our estimation in the second quarter, the net profit keep increasing strongly, and it can increase uh, the the earning growth of this year roughly around fifty to to seventy percent. So the reason why we we will keep focus much more uh, our portfolio on manufacturing stock and public investment beneficiary. Please go to the next. So even though we are restructuring a little bit our portfolio to switching from high dividend stock to uh, the crow stock, but we still we still follow the index uh, performance. So in the in the first six months, the index increased twelve percent. We have eleven point six percent, a little bit zero point five percent lower than the index. But actually, because we we go we are in restructuring process almost done so i think in the next maybe one or two months we will finish this process and we think after we we're done we will grow very fast and if you look at the chart you, you see that we already did very well in the last 10 years so we much more than double compared to index and um an etf fund so i strongly believe that we can do it in the next five years the same thing we will make another make record successful story I strongly believe that. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody, and also especially Vicente for your usual interesting and insightful presentations. We will now answer some of the many questions we have already received from the participants. But you all can still submit more questions during this Q&A session through the Q&A bottom uh, at the bottom of, the, of this uh, Zoom screen in front of you. So the first question is for Ruchi. What is the outlook for Bangladesh? The, its stock market trades at a premium and it's not performing. Yeah, I think a uh, couple of things in Bangladesh. One, in terms of the outlook, well, to be honest, I don't think I don't see any major trigger until the elections happen. I think that's with most emerging markets. Elections are due end of this year. So until that happens, we won't see any major policy changes or any major trigger from the stock market. Uh, and also the stock market is underperforming mainly because of this reason, given the fact that this election uncertainty in run up, in run up to these uh, upcoming elections. That's always the case in Bangladesh. And also in terms of the valuations, Bangladesh always has traded a premium because uh, the market is not as broad as say Vietnam or say Pakistan. Only a few names account for large part of the index and some of the names are trading at a premium. But having said that, most of our companies that we own in Bangladesh are trading at a pretty reasonable valuation or putting, trading at you know less than the market P. So uh, that's the way I would look at it. So I don't, just from a just from a stock market performance perspective, I I don't see major, a major recovery at least uh, in, until 2024. Okay, and then one thing uh, we need also to mention is the this measurements by the you know, regulator or the stock exchange to have this uh, limit floor price. on the, the yeah. floor price and then also the movements yeah. up a little bit, but a special floor price that really reduces the uh, investment activity and uh, uh, the volatility of the stocks. And yeah, also that has to be abolished and it's never good that yeah. regulators intervene into a stock market the stock market should the price should be freely and uh, discovered and not by a regulator fixed okay then another question from a very good friend of mine from where that's for vicente from where is yeah. the v, uh, vietnamese government getting money for uh, i assume for this investment for the infrastructure investments Okay, so first of all, actually, Vietnamese government got a lot of uh, uh, tax and uh, the budget income in the last three years, during, especially during the COVID. So every single year, the government uh, always have the state budget surplus, almost every year. And um, right now, uh, the resource of the government also is quite big. So compared to uh, 10 years ago, the, the foreign reserve of Vietnam is roughly around 20 billion US dollar only. But right now they, we have nearly 100 billion US dollar. And another thing is the public debt of Vietnamese government is only around 50% of GDP. So it's com 
is uh, um, uh, relative low compared to other country in reason. So the government can easily issue uh, more bond to, uh, but normally right now, Vietnamese not, normally still use the local currency's bond. So it's easily to issue the bond for uh, into the um, domestic market. And most of the buyer are, are local bank and local insurer. Okay, thanks, Vicente. Another question for Ruchir. How do you explain the low PEs of the Kazakh market? Well, actually, that's a pretty easy answer. If you look at the major listings in Kazakhstan, for example, Halik Bank, which is the biggest commercial bank in Kazakhstan that trades at about P of three times, I believe, right now. Uh, so, it's, and this trading at P of three times because not because it's not doing well or because it's discounted because of you know, poor fundamentals or poor sentiment. It's just because the earnings have been doing very well over the last few years. And of course, there's a bit of a discount over there. Uh, because of the geopolitical premium in with, with respect to what's going on in the region with Russia and Ukraine and the sole geopolitics in the region. Uh, so I would say one is the main reason for the low PE ratios is the company, the companies themselves trade the, at a pretty big discount to the region. Uh, for example, Halleck back trades at three times. Caspi, which is a fintech company, which will do net profits about $1.8 billion this year, is trading at about 10 times. Uh, uh, so that's one and two. I think is general geopolitical premium on stocks in Central Asia because of what's going on in the region, and that's the key reason why Kazakhstan trades at a, at a discount uh, to the region. Okay, thanks a lot, uh, Vicente. You are the man. Uh, another question for Vietnam. Uh, it seems that the Vietnam uh, stock market is being driven by the local uh, market again by by the retailers or local investors. Recently, we saw local investors abandon the market and this led to its collapse. Do you think this could happen again in the short term? Yeah, first of all, we see in the last five years, I think in the last five years, local individual investors already overwhelmed the market with daily trading. So every single day, they maybe contribute 80%, some time is even 90% daily trading. And um, so it re the reason why they are uh, impact quite a lot to the market. So as you as you said that you saw the local investor abandon the market. No, they didn't leave the market, but they they just how to say I I, I gotta say that they they become hibernate sometime and they they just wait and look at the market because a number we saw that uh, every single month new local investor call are opened. And for many months, for many, many, many months, at least in the last 12 months, uh, the first time we saw more than 100,000 accounts, new, new 100,000 accounts were open in June. So it means they come back. Uh, come back here, it means that they, they didn't leave, but uh, uh, the markets become more attractive and it's attract more local investors. But the own investor is still there, they, they didn't leave but they become more excited and more aggressive on the market. So I don't think that uh, they will leave again because they didn't leave, but uh, because it's driven by local uh, individual investors. So the market is quite emotional sometimes. So, and we are long investors. So we, 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 we don't follow this kind of thing and we just track the value of the company. So that's what we are doing. Okay, thank you. Ahmed, one for you. Uh, what would motivate foreigners to invest in the Iraqi stock market uh, in the next coming of weeks or months? Well, wow, that's a that, that that's a uh, a very interesting question and something that I've been um, looking at. I think one of it's got to be the uh, change in news flows. I mean, one of it's got to be the the outlook on, on frontier markets. We've sort of need to see them positive, but also um, the fact that. Uh, in the last few years, um, you know, apart from I think us and maybe one other fund, there's hardly any other uh, foreign investors in in, in the country, um, and and so therefore, you know, sort of all of those who came in have left um, sadly at, at at the wrong time, uh, but nevertheless, I think uh, when uh, people and markets will begin to see um, the the performance of of various uh, the, at least the two Iraq funds or at least the Iraq market as such. And they begin to uh, to ask questions and look at it. And as the uh, cycle of negative news seems to have come to an end, 
um, that would drive uh, interest, I believe. But certainly the performance of the market itself will drive an interest. And therefore, um, I think if it does, and if you see foreigners come in, they could do the same thing as they did in, in 2011, 2012, which um, sent the market to a high. But at the time, I believe it was uh, premature um, as the country wasn't that ready. I hope so, Ahmed. I mean, the, 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 uh, your fund is now up this year to, uh, year to date is what, 40, how much percent? Well, as of as of today, it's up fifty two percent. I mean, fifty two percent. So I hope it will entice some of the foreign investors <laughs> to invest. Well, well, I, I I certainly hope so. I mean, and, and again, I think most people will say, "Ah, we missed it." And I think, yeah, there is a possibility of that. That's always the case. The risk is always high when uh, stocks and markets do perform. However, as I said earlier, you're looking at it from a very very low base. You're not looking at it as a market that is near its prime. Market that is at its bottom. Look at the charts again. Look at other markets. Um, you know, um, I mean, every country has its own um, um, positives and negatives, I think. But the case of investing for Iraq, you have a multi-year uh, story that comes in from uh, reconstructing reinvestments. And that's what I tried to show on the first slide. And secondly, a positive macro uh, macro drop and something that Iraq has, has not had since early, uh, you know, before the 80s, uh, stability. I think everybody who's, who's seen the pictures and Hopefully, which would see Iraq would realize the, the potential opportunity that's there. Thank Ahmed, you for that. Ahmed, you don't need to convince me. <laughs> uh, your, your fund is my biggest uh, holding of all four uh, AFC funds uh, well, right now. And that that sounds, also thanks to your performance. <laughs> that sounds sound good. I hope we'll double it for you by the end of the year. Another one, yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay, good. Then here's a question for, uh, we change the end for Scott. Uh, the growth of the Chinese economy has been weak for some time. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's not weak. I mean, has been still one of the best, I would say, uh, but has been uh, slower than it used to be or lower. To what extent does the second largest economy mm. in the world uh, influence the growth of Vietnam, frontier countries and Uzbekistan? Also, maybe uh, uh, Ruchia, if you want to invest, uh, uh, answer this one then as a third person for the other markets. Uh, Scott, start first, then uh, Vicente, and then Ruchir. So impact uh, of China, slow down. It, it probably won't affect Uzbekistan very much. I mean, Uzbekistan's biggest trading partner right now is China, but that's only because uh, we're importing a huge amount of machinery um, from the country and then exporting increasingly uh, horticultural products. But you know, you're, import, you're exporting horticultural products to China um, which otherwise would be sourced from New Zealand, Australia, maybe California. Uh, so logistically and also price-wise, it's much cheaper. Um, and then you look at Chinese investment in the country. Chinese investment is slowly picking up. I'm seeing more Chinese on the ground, more uh, supermarkets, a few small hotels opening. Uh, but everyone that I've spoken with for years in Uzbekistan, you know, firstly, in Central Asia, there's not a, a huge appetite, as you see in Southeast Asia, for the Chinese coming in in a very big way. Um, the Chinese are mainly there as EPC contractors. So they're being hired by, say, the government or uh, some of the development banks to build and construct infrastructure. Um, but over the past few months, they've signed deals to build a few solar plants. BYD, the uh, electric car company from China, is doing joint venture with Uzovto, uh, the state owned auto company. They're going to build a domestic factory. So uh, the Chinese slowdown really has, isn't having any impact on Uzbekistan, since Uzbekistan is still very much a domestic growth story from a consumption and investment angle. Uh, Vicente? Okay, so actually when the Chinese economy slowed down, it makes a huge impact on Vietnam because China is the largest trade partner of Vietnam. It's the largest one, it's much bigger than US. US is the largest uh, market of Vietnam, but China is largest partner. So, however, most of the neg negative impact is for FDI company in Vietnam, like Samsung, LG, or other international company because they, they produce product in Vietnam and, and export to, to China actually is, is make a, a negative impact. For example, Samsung revenue dropped down more than 20% in, in the first quarter, for example. However, on the opposite side, uh, because after China opened the, the market, uh, reopened the border, we, Vietnamese Im 
export a lot of key agriculture products to China, like rice, like fruit, like vegetable, coffee. So according to uh, the statistic number, the value, um, rice values to export to China increased 500%. The fruits export to, to, to China increased more than 100%. And um, the coffee is brought to, to China also more than 100 percent. And those kind of products is related to listed companies, not FDI. So actually, for the economy, it's, yeah, absolutely it has some kind of negative impact. But for the, for, for the stock market, somehow it's really helped because, for example, one of position of our company is a right exporter. The largest rice exported in Vietnam because of the rice price increased sharply and they export a lot of to China. So the net profit increased sharply and the stock price also increased 30% yeah, this month, for example. So great. Yes. That's good. Uh, I mean, now, if, uh, if uh, I just, here, one uh, minute uh, because uh, the seminar yeah. ends first. So uh, for your 10 uh, markets, yeah, quick, one yeah. minute. May, yeah, maybe uh, one minute and 30 seconds. Very quickly. Uh, I mean, just I would answer this question a bit differently. I mean, yes, China is slowing down, but I think the one of the biggest trends which you're seeing in our markets, especially like for example in Bangladesh and Vietnam, is this manufacturing shift from mainland China into Vietnam and Bangladesh. So that's that's a big positive actually. So yes, China is slowing down. Maybe it's a big trading trading part for Vietnam, but you're seeing a huge number of investments coming into Vietnam because of this geopolitical tension between the West and China. That's actually benefiting our markets in terms of FTI and those exports, which is a big driver for performance, economic growth, and also job, you know, job creation and income levels. And two, I think also from a tourism perspective, yes, Chinese tourists account for 30% of pre-pandemic arrivals in Vietnam, but other countries are making up for that. For example, you're seeing arrivals from India and other markets come up, come up in Vietnam, and Vietnam is back to 70% of pre-pandemic arrivals as well. And Sri Lanka is doing very well without Chinese tourists as well. And also Maldives has gone back to pre-pandemic arrivals without China. So I don't think that's really an impact so much. And plus, our, in general, besides Vietnam, our markets don't really trade so much with China. And just a quick third quick, quick point is that because of the solar in China, I think many investors, at least from what I read in the press, they're looking for Asia X China investments investments now. That's a new trend, Asia X China instead of Asia X Japan. So Asia X China. So I think from that perspective, one can look at Asian frontier markets because they're not so correlated with China or the Chinese slowdown. And as the performance of so far this year of our fund is also Asian frontier markets have shown, I think it can be a good hedge against uh, what's going on in China just from a stock market performance and also economic growth perspective. So that's the way I would answer this question. Yeah, Ruchi, that's a very good point, this X, uh, Asia X uh, China uh, investment uh, trend. Thank you. This concludes our webinar today. And since we still had some unanswered questions, we will answer them directly by email. And if you have any further question, you can always reach us by email. I hope you enjoyed this webinar. We will continue to hold quarterly webinars in the future, and we will announce them in our upcoming monthly newsletters. Good night to our participants in Asia and to the others. Enjoy the rest of the day. <laughs>